Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sue Ellen. Uh, I want to thank the Martha's Vineyard uh, Book Festival author series for including me uh, this summer in the roster. And I want to thank all of you for uh, coming out tonight to hear me speak. Um, a little bit of housekeeping first. Uh, I'm going to uh, go through some remarks. We're going to have a Q&A after that. If we do not get to your question in the course of the evening, you can always go to amortolls.com and if you go to the contact page, your questions or comments come straight to me. Now that's an amazing thing about the modern era, that that can happen, but it has its setbacks. <laughs> and <laughs> because at this stage, uh, it usually takes about 10 days after one of my books to come out for the corrections to start rolling in. And to give you some sort of flavor for that, uh, I thought I'd share a couple with you uh, here, and so you can kind of get a sense of which ones might be helpful and which ones might not be. <laughs> so here's an email I received. Uh, Dear, Mr. <laughs> Dear Mr. Tolls, you start too many sentences with I-N-G words. <laughs> that is not helpful. <laughs> Now, the best part of this email is how it concludes. Looking, <laughs> sorry, sorry. looking forward to your next book. Uh, so, uh, for, this, uh, for this nice uh, email I received, uh, we're gonna set this up for you a little bit. Late in the Lincoln Highway, uh, the central characters are gathered in a fancy home in New York, and they have a sort of a fancy dinner, and things go awry, uh, becomes a bit of a mess, and so late at night, the hero, Emmett Watson, is, finds himself alone in the kitchen, uh, doing uh, cleaning up uh, by himself as sort of an act of atonement after this messy dinner. Um, and so I received uh, this email from uh, Karen of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Karen writes, on page 477, you describe how Emmett was doing the dishes, saying that Emmett first washed the plates, then the crystal, then the pots. <laughs> As the winner of the 1973 Betty Crocker Future Homemaker Award, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at my high school, I can tell you with some authority that the proper way to wash dishes is first the crystal, <laughs> then the plates, and finally the pots. <laughs> yes, thank you, Karen from Wisconsin. <laughs> so here's another favorite of mine, and, and so to set this up uh, earlier in the novel, uh, the Duchess, uh, the character's Duchess and Willie borrow Emmett's Studebaker, and they are driving across Iowa in it, and uh, they get, they're coming through Ames, Iowa in the morning, and they run out of gas. They don't have any money, and so Duchess gets out of the car, and he looks up the road, and he's trying to decide what to do, and he sees that there's a liquor store up the road, and he figures it's probably not open yet because it's still early in the morning, and so uh, he could go, and if he could break in in the back of the liquor store, he might find some money in the till, or worst case scenario, he could take a couple of bottles of whiskey and give them to the gas station attendant in exchange for gas. You know, this is his notion. Um, so I received this email uh, from Jane of Pequot Lake, Minnesota. There were no liquor stores in Ames, Iowa in 1954. <laughs> Hard liquor and wine could only be purchased at the county seat. This meant that my parents, who were heavy drinkers, <laughs> had to drive all the way to Boone. Every week, my mother and I would drive to Boone uh, to buy a case of Gallo wine, some Gallo vermouth, and a no-name bourbon. When you paid, the clerk would produce a large ledger where you had to write down your purchases and sign it. Uh, my favorite part of this email is the PS. PS. I lived across the street from Miss Evans, my fourth grade teacher. She told my mom that Mr. Harlan, our principal, would review the liquor store log every week to see how much and what his teachers were drinking. 
Now, uh, you know, since the book has been out now for about nine months, we are wrapping up the correction phase, everybody. <laughs> but if you want to share with me your parents' drinking habits, you are free to do so. All right. So, uh, I've written fiction since I was a kid, uh, and I wrote fiction in high school, in college, and in graduate school. And, and over the course of my life, I've had many ideas for stories or novels. Now, most of the time, when I have an idea for a story, it tends to come as a very simple notion, sort of a, a often that I could be described in a single sentence. Like, um, a guy gets trapped in a hotel for a long period of time. <laughs> Now, you know, when I, I had, uh, you know, that notion, which of course was the basis of the starting point of A Gentleman in Moscow, the notion usually comes very quickly, I mean in a matter of minutes, with some attachments to it, as it were. So when I had that idea of a guy trapped in a hotel, I immediately thought, oh great, it could be in Russia. That would be great. And uh, it could be an aristocrat sentenced to house arrest in a fancy hotel across the street from the Kremlin, and it could go from the revolution all the way to the Cold War. So I knew all that really in a matter of minutes. Now what happens is I take that, and if it really intrigues me, is I'll start to dig more deeply into it. Uh, and over the course of a period of years, I will work through uh, handwriting in a series of notebooks. I will try to imagine every aspect of the story. Everything that happens, all the settings, the characters and their backgrounds, uh, some of the poetics, uh, some of the philosophical elements, some of the sentiments, I'll all be working that out through over what I would call a design phase. Once I know the book from beginning to end in that sense, I will outline it uh, to serve a practical purpose, and only then will I begin writing chapter one. Now, in the case of The Lincoln Highway, it was very similar. Uh, for those of you who read the book, you could probably guess where my starting point was, which was this notion of an honorable young man, you know, about uh, 18, uh, who uh, is being driven home from a juvenile work facility uh, by the warden, having just completed his, his time at the facility, and uh, being basically, in essence, ready to start his life anew. And uh, unfortunately, what happens is that as the warden is driving away, our hero discovers that two of his friends from the work camp have hidden in the trunk of the warden's car, and they have a very different sense of what he should be doing with his future. Now this is my starting point. I had sort of had this idea of the two guys in the trunk of the car and the honorable kid up front with the warden. And uh, once again, this came right off the bat with a series of attachments. So right away, I thought, oh, yes, yeah, it'd be great. We could be in the, uh, the 50s, it'll be a story in the 50s. Um, the hero uh, will be returning to the family farm, which is in bankruptcy. Uh, his mother is long gone. His father has died while he's doing time. Uh, he, and his intention is to get his younger brother, get into his prized automobile of, of the Studebaker, and head to California. But the two guys in the trunk are going to get him to go to New York City instead. And the whole story will last 10 days. Now, all that, as I say, I knew in the first few minutes. And then you go through this uh, multi-year process of trying to imagine the story in every detail before I set around to actually writing chapter one. Now, having said I knew all that, one thing that I did not know was when the hero, his brother, and the two friends leave the farm, and uh, instead of turning left and going to California, they take a right and head to New York, one thing I did not know is what road they would take. <clears throat> if you went back and look in my notebooks uh, that I had written over those period of years, it would refer to Route X. That's the road they took. And that was fine for the purposes of imagining the story in greater and greater detail. But eventually I got to the point where I was crafting the first chapter, in essence, and I needed to know more about the specifics of the journey east. Because obviously which road they took might take them through a different city, a different landscape, that might lead to different events that I hadn't anticipated yet, or a different sort of flavor of the narrative. So it was time to kind of pin that down. So I took out a map of the Midwest, and I sort of was searching for the road that would suit my purposes, and I found it from middle of Nebraska heading straight east, and it's Route 30, and I'm looking out saying, yeah, that's it. And then I noticed that in small print underneath Route 30, it says, uh, formerly known as the Lincoln Highway. And I thought to myself, well, you know, what in Lord's name is the Lincoln Highway? And so I did some investigation, and very quickly it was clear that 
everything about the Lincoln Highway I discovered was crazy, totally amazing, um, and thralling, and I immediately knew that that was exactly the road that should be at the center of the story, and in fact, I changed the name of the book. So the, if you look at my first notebooks, they have a different title. Was, the book was called Unfinished Business, but from that point forward, it was called The Lincoln Highway instead. And now, why, what is it about The Lincoln Highway, the actual road, um, that made it feel so perfect for me as a metaphor at the center of this narrative? Well, to understand that, uh, we have to go back and start with this guy. Oh, there he is. So this is Carl Fisher, uh, born in 1874. Carl Fisher was born in the Indianapolis area, and uh, he's a classic American, American success story. Uh, his father abandoned the family when he was a boy, and so at the age of 13, he dropped out of school in order to get a job and earn money to support his mother and his siblings. From that moment forward, everything in Carl Fisher's life is about motion. His first job at the age of 13 is he goes into the train station in Indianapolis, and when the trains come in, he runs on the train and he sells cigarettes, tobacco, uh, cigarettes, candy, magazines, and newspapers, and runs off the train, jumps off the train as it's leaving the station. You know, this is his first job. Now, in uh, the late 1880s, the bicycle is beginning to come of age in the United States, and uh, Carl becomes a bicycle fan. So at the age of 17, uh, he opens his uh, uh, bicycle repair shop, one of the first bicycle repair shops in the Indianapolis area. Uh, a few years later, the car comes of age, is coming of age in the United States. And Carl uh, loves the automobile. I mean, if he liked bikes, he loves cars. And uh, he actually breaks several land speed records uh, in primitive automobiles. Uh, he begins to race uh, cars. And eventually, he opens up one of the first automotive repair shops in Indianapolis, right next to the bike repair shop. As an automotive repair maintenance guy, uh, he gets firsthand knowledge of what goes wrong in cars, what causes the accidents. And in particular, he notes that uh, the headlights that the early cars were outfitted with were not very effective at night, and particularly in bad weather, resulting in crashes. So, uh, in uh, 1907, he licenses the technology for, excuse me, 1904, he licenses the technology from a beacon company that puts beacons in lighthouses and in buoys, light buoys. He licenses that technology, he applies it to the automobile, and within about five years, every car in America has the Presto Light headlamp as a part of its body. Um, in uh, 1911, uh, uh, Union Carbide buys uh, Carl out. And so he finds himself at the age of 37, married without children, worth about $150 million in today's terms, in retirement. Now he does not take to retirement very well because he's a very restless personality. Um, so he's immediately looking for things to do. First thing he does is he goes back, he returns to his love of, of car racing. Now, just to give you a flavor for this, this is a picture of Carl in one of the earliest automobiles. This is a car that he did break a land speed record in, but that gives you a sense of how early he was in the car game. Um, but so uh, he decides, uh, he's getting, gets, goes back to doing some car racing. And at the time, you know, this is 1912, 13, 14, uh, car racing was itself very primitive. It would be two guys, out on a dirt road, challenging each other, you know, that was the whole thing. And Carl starts to think about it, and he figures, you know, if there was a paved surface that you could race on, in the shape of an oval, I bet that you could attract uh, some serious racers in better automobiles from around the area uh, to make the sport more interesting. So, Carl builds the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Now, he turns out to be, he's absolutely right. As soon as he builds it, uh, car enthusiasts from out throughout the Midwest and in the Northeast are coming to Indianapolis in order to drive on this new track. And Carl figures, you know, if we actually had a formal race where we brought the best drivers from around the country uh, and we had a good stakes put up for the race for the winner and we built stands, I bet people would come to watch. So this is what Carl did. He launched a little thing known as the Indy 500, 
And uh, the first year he does, uh, they, he sponsors it, 80,000 people come to watch the race. Now, around this time, uh, Carl is spending his winters with his wife in Florida, because he's in, reti he's in retirement, and uh, his, the, their chosen place to winter is Miami. Now, at the time, again, this is say around 1914, Miami, the, the town of Miami, the city of Miami, the luxurious homes, the hotels, the restaurants were all on the shore of the Biscayne Bay. Miami was built on the shore of the Biscayne Bay, then you had the Biscayne Bay, and beyond the Biscayne Bay you had a narrow barrier island and then the Atlantic Ocean. That was the setup of Miami. And uh, Carl's got a beautiful home on the Biscayne Bay. Uh, because he's a guy who loves motion, the first thing he does is he buys himself a motor yacht. And he would go zipping back and forth on the Biscayne Bay uh, to pass the time during the winter. Now, as he's doing this one day, he notices that there is a bridge which begins in Miami, goes halfway over the Biscayne Bay, and stops. And Carl gets intrigued by what is this bridge, that, what is this doing here? So he figures it must have been headed to the barrier island. So he goes out to the barrier island, he gets, anchors the boat, goes on shore, and he discovers that the barrier island is owned by an old farmer. And the farmer is growing avocados on the barrier island. And the farmer's notion was to grow the avocados on the barrier island and then drive them over a bridge and sell them to the restaurants and the people in Miami. Uh, that, was a, that was the business plan. But he got halfway through building the bridge and ran out of money. Now, as Carl is walking around the farm with the old man, he's thinking to himself, you know, this is a nice place to have a vacation home. Because since it's on this barrier island, it's like 10 degrees cooler than Miami, it has a much better breeze, and you've got the views of the Atlantic. So, Carl tells the old man, I'll tell you what, I will finish your bridge in exchange for a piece of your land. So the old man says, they make a deal. He says, sure thing. And so the old man gives Carl a one mile stretch of the island from shore to shore in exchange for Carl finishing the bridge. Carl finishes the bridge, he dredges part of the Biscayne Bay, and then he takes a little corner of his new land on the ocean, and he builds this, <laughs> which is the Flamingo Hotel. Now, as soon as he builds this, you can imagine, everybody of wealth in Miami wanted to cross the Biscayne Bay and build their house on the beach, on the Atlantic Ocean Beach. The restaurants and the hotels uh, came soon after, and so by... Uh, b building this in a, uh, a hotel, in essence, Carl created the township of what is now known as Miami Beach. Um, he owns this giant piece of land, and so, of course, as he's selling the plots for various purposes, he builds a second fortune. Um, now, during this time, as Carl is uh, sort of driving back and forth from the Midwest to Florida with his wife, he becomes very disenchanted with the state of American roads. Um, now, you have to picture that uh, in the 19-teens, uh, roads were not really designed to go long distances. Uh, there were two million miles of roads at the time, and 90% of them were unpaved. Now, this meant that if there was heavy rain, uh, the old car could get stuck and, and really could not make any headway. Um, but in addition, in a way more, uh, a, a greater problem, was the fact that the way that roads ev evolve anywhere in the United States and Europe is that they start in some kind of a township where there is a you know, train station and a post office and a bank and the, you know, the, the central hardware store, what have you, and then roads spiderweb out from that township into the countryside, out to the farms, to the residences, maybe into light manufacturing, but that's really what roads evolved to do, is to solve this problem of getting you know, the farmer into town and back out again. What roads weren't really designed to do was to go long distances across country, say from Boston to Denver. That's what trains were for. And so the freight and passengers who wanted to go from Boston to Denver would take the trains. There were no roads that would go that length of time. A distance. Now, in addition, if you went out and tried to make the journey yourself, what you'd find is you'd get like, uh, you know, 100 miles beyond uh, Nashville, let's say, and you'd find yourself kind of in wilderness. And there's no gas stations, no hotels. Um, so those who chose to cross the country at this early stage of the car would have to take with them 
all their gas, or extra gas at least, uh, water, uh, medical supplies, repair equipment, tents, food, you name it. And if you look at the cars that were crossing the country at that time, they basically look like polar expeditions. <laughs> this was not a vacation. All right. So Carl looked at that and he thought, this needs to change. It should be easy for Americans in the era of the car to go across the country. In particular, Americans should be able to go from sea to shining sea. That was his vision. It was principally a patriotic one, is that he wanted to give Americans the chance to use the car to see this great nation of theirs. Um, now, at the time, and he decided he was going to do something about it. Uh, now, at the time, the federal government was not involved in roads at all. It had no involvement in roads. So, uh, Carl decided, I'll do it myself. And he uh, launched a barnstorming tour. He would go up and down the East Coast and through the major cities in the Midwest, pitching the benefits of this road and asking for money. He convinces uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt to give him money for the project. He convinces Thomas Edison to give him money for the project. He convinces the CEOs of Goodyear and Packard Carr to give him money. He goes to you know, the common citizen and ultimately the Boy Scouts get involved. And after a few years, he successfully raises the multi-million dollar budget to build this road. Um, oh, and, well, and here it is. So this is the Lincoln Highway. Um, you know, if you're in the back, if you can't see that, I'm sorry, but that's what you get for being late. <laughs> but so, uh, it starts in New York City in Times Square, and it goes virtually due west uh, through 12 of the uh, continental states, ending in Lincoln Park in uh, San Francisco. Um, now, having said how difficult it was for people to cross the country uh, when, uh, before the Lincoln Highway, Two years after Carl builds the Lincoln Highway, uh, sorry, two years before he builds the highway, 150 people try to drive across the country in total over the course of a year. Uh, five years after he builds the highway, 20,000 Americans do it every year. So it represents a major change in the way that Americans view their mobility in the nation, which obviously has implications for commerce, but also just for tourism and for the opportunity for people to move from one side of the country to the other with reasonable uh, ease. Um, and once this happens, really, the Lincoln Highway becomes the most famous road in America by far. Um, like a lot of inventions, uh, the Lincoln Highway ended up sowing the seeds of its own demise in this very interesting way. And what happened is that uh, in 1919, in the aftermath of the First World War, the uh, generals, the chiefs of staff, were concerned that the American people would lose interest in having an active military. Right? This, there wasn't a giant standing military there in 1900 in the United States. What happened is the war began, and once we got involved, a military was built, and great investment was made in making equipment, state-of-the-art equipment, and building out a, an infrastructure to fight in the war. And so, as I say, the chiefs of staff were concerned that now that the war was over, and we went back into an era of peace, the American citizens would say, we don't need the army. We don't need to invest in it. We don't need the equipment. Uh, certainly we don't need it very much, and that the budget would shrink and the, the army would begin to dissipate. So there's sort of a little bit of a self-preservation here, obviously, issue for, in terms of the chiefs of staff, but they wanted, they thought that America needed a robust standing military at all times, with, with uh, state-of-the-art equipment at all times, and they wanted to make that case to the American people. And so as a part of making the case to the American people, they came up with this PR stunt, and the PR stunt was going to be that they were going to take a convoy that showcased American might and technology from the First World War, and they were going to drive it all the way across the country, sort of stopping as they went to show the American people how terrific the American military was at that point in time and to convince them that they should continue to invest in it. Um, the convoy that they were going to take across the country, uh, let me describe it for you, it was made up of about 80 vehicles. And this included heavy-duty trucks, fuel tankers, artillery tractors, an aerial searchlight truck, armed reconnaissance cars, ambulances, and motorcycles, collectively manned by 35 officers and 260 enlisted men. This is the stunt. 
They're going to drive this convoy across the country. Now, the plan was to start at the White House and then uh, cross the country. How did they do it? The Lincoln Highway. It was the only way to do it. And Lincoln Highway was very famous, as I said, so it seemed like the perfect way to run uh, this PR event. And uh, that's what they did. They gathered the convoy at the White House, literally at the White House. They drove north. As soon as they hit the Lincoln Highway, they turned west, and they went across the country. Um, and it was a total fiasco. And the reason it was a fiasco is all that equipment that, they were, that had been designed for battlefields was really too much for the highway to bear at that early stage, which was really just one lane in either direction, the road. But in addition, there still weren't gas stations, restaurants, hotels, along giant expanses. So anytime they got in trouble, they got broke down, it would all back up, and they'd have, you know, they were days away from where they were supposed to be at the, you know, particular, they were supposed to sort of be there and arrive in a town, and there would be a big parade, and they, they would arrive you know, three days too late kind of thing. So it was a disaster. Um, but the interesting element here was that one of the young officers who was in charge of running this convoy, who was on the convoy and overseeing it, was a young lieutenant colonel who had recently returned from the First World War, and his name was Dwight David Eisenhower. And so he lived the fiasco. So 30 years later, when he became the president of the United States, one of the first things he did was say, we are going to build a national highway system. And sure enough, in the mid-50s, he does build this. Now, I can't be, so oh, I put my glasses. Uh, this is the national highway system that gets built in the 1950s. And if you can read the top, what it says is the national system of interstate and defense highways. Because that's what it was designed as and pitched as. This was a defense highway system. That's how they convinced the American people to spend their tax money on the project. Yes, it was going to be good for commerce and tourism, but more importantly, it was going to be essential to the protection of the country. And so the notion was, if we were to get attacked in a new, uh, by a new enemy in the, in the years ahead, we wouldn't know where they were coming. They could come to the Pacific, the Atlantic, they could come from the Mexican border, the Canadian border, and they could come from two different directions, either simultaneously or over a short period of time. Given that, and they weren't going to warn you where and when, how would you move the people and the equipment quickly to get from one border where you're fighting a battle to another one where you were needed? And the highway system was the answer. And that's why you have this intricate cross-patching. It's so that you could get anywhere in the country uh, within a matter of you know, days uh, with all of your heavy equipment. And so suddenly what you have is these multi-lane highways designed for high-speed, heavy-duty travel that skirted many of the old towns that the Lincoln Highway would have uh, gone through. And uh, as a result, the Lincoln Highway becomes obsolete, and today it looks like this. And, you know, that's a picture that I took on the highway uh, about a year ago. Um, and it's quite, you can still drive it uh, the, from, Lincoln, uh, from uh, Times Square to San Francisco. You can still drive the Lincoln Highway. Uh, you have to kind of look for where it is as you move along. It's not always uh, clearly marked because it does zigzag a little bit as you move through uh, the Midwest. Um, but if you go to Times Square today at 42nd Street and Broadway, there is still the classic New York green street sign that indicates the beginning of the Lincoln Highway uh, there in Times Square. Um, now, most of, of what I've just told you, virtually everything that I've just told you, is not in the book. It's not in the book. You know, because, I, you know, the Lincoln Highway, uh, my book, is a novel. You know, it's not a work of history. It's not a Wikipedia entry. It is a novel. And so appropriately, at its center, at its heart, are individuals. And in particular, in this story, it is a group of 18-year-old or 19-year-old young people uh, mostly boys, uh, but a young woman as well, uh, who are at that moment in time where they are beginning to understand that they have the liberty and the responsibility of deciding their lives for themselves. That it is up to them to decide uh, what they're capable of, uh, to decide what kind of people they want to uh, uh, be around. It's up to them to decide what is the difference between right and wrong, what is right and what is wrong, and ultimately to decide uh, who they want to become. And that's really 
what the book is at its heart is about, is that moment in time for any of us. Um, now, having said all this, I would be happy to answer any of your questions, and if you do not have any questions, I will ask them myself. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, now, oh, we do have, we have microphones moving, so if we have a raised hand, we can bring a mic to you. It's the long way around. Okay, sorry. Thank you very much. I have a very specific question, and it's not about the Lincoln Highway. Okay. It's about my favorite book of yours, The Rules of Civility. Okay. And you just mentioned at the end of your talk decisions made by teenagers. Yes. But in the last, and I'm not giving anything away, folks, about the rules of civility, but in the last two pages of the rules of civility, fabulous paragraphs about decision-making. Yes. Whether or not people can control their lives by making decisions that have ramifications for the rest of their lives. That's right. Yeah. Or whether at the end of the day, fortune and fate play a role, and it may not really matter whether you make those decisions or not. My question, very specific question, when you wrote those last two pages, fabulous pages, I read them 20 times, wow. impacted my life. When you wrote those last two pages, is this just your creative end of the story? Or does it reflect your own personal experiences in your life okay. about decisions? How do you decide what you're going to put down on paper? Okay, that's a, compl that's a complex question. Thank you. Um, so I, I think the, I, I want to say sort of two things about it, I guess. And, and the first is, uh, as I say, I design my books in great detail, and so I know a lot of what's going to happen, and I know uh, the people, the settings, the events, etc. Um, and I know some of the thematic content, but I don't spend a lot of time thinking about what is the book about. I don't. And I kind of trust in the artistic process that the meaning of the book will grow and, and develop through the writing process itself. And if, as long as I make a narrative that is rich nuanced and layered enough that it'll create a, an opportunity for readers to discover different kinds of themes in the course of reading it. And uh, so when I'm outlining, when I have my outline, what ends up happening is that uh, while I'm writing the first third of a book, the back third of the outline is getting increasingly more detailed. Because what's happening is I'm going through a process of discovery myself as I'm getting to know the characters better, as I'm seeing them interact, as I'm hearing uh, the issues that they are actually beginning to express between each other, as I see the landscape, the objects that they're using, the places that they're going, all these various elements, I start to get insight into, oh, you know, in the, at the end, you know, this should recur. You know, this, 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 or, or, you know, in the back third, they should revisit this conversation. Or, in fact, I'm going to move this whole conversation to the back because that's where it belongs. Or this, this item that they're discussing on the table is going to show up in that room. Or they're going to return to this address or whatever it is. So as I'm writing the first third of the book, the back outline is getting more and more filled with these kinds of things. So the, the passage that you're talking about is, without a doubt, a culmination rather than a starting point. It is one of those things where, in the course of the writing, I'm getting a better and stronger sense of, in essence, what the book is about, and then you end up, uh, uh, and, I, and I'll start to put notes to myself towards the back of the book. I say, oh yeah, this is, this is really what it is. And, and I think, you know, a, a breaking point in that uh, thought process was the notion of uh, Honeymoon Bridge. Uh, I, was a, I played bridge as a kid. I played it with my grandmother, my father. Honeymoon Bridge is a, is a sort of a way of playing bridge with only two players, um, obviously, Bridge is really a four-person game. And the way it works is that uh, you, you draw um, a card. You're going to build your hand. You draw a card, and you decide, do I want to keep this card uh, or, or, or not have it in my hand? If I keep it, I'm allowed to look at the next card and throw it out. So I now have a card in my hand, and I've seen one that I don't have. And then you go. 
And we go back and forth and back and forth, and at the end of this process, I have 13 cards in my hand, you have 13 cards in your hand, but we've each seen 13 discarded cards as well. Because the other thing is, is if I choose to keep it, I look and throw out, or I throw this out and I have to take the next card. All right, more than you need to know. I was like, but I'm like, oh, you know, Katie is gonna, she, she and Wallace, uh, Wallace are gonna play cards, gonna be part of the romance. Yeah, they'll play Honeymoon Bridge, that's great. And as I'm literally writing the section where, where they're about to start playing, I think to myself, you know what? That process of drawing this card and time, do I keep it or do I bet, do I gamble that the next one's a better card and I take that but I have to keep it? This is really what they're all going through at that point in their lives. That's what being 25 is all about. Right, is that you're making these things, you're making these rapid decisions, you're taking one thing and discarding another, you're dating her, not her, you take this job, not that job, you move from this neighborhood to that neighborhood, and it feels very freewheeling, and like it's all gonna change and change and change, and suddenly at some point, in a way, at a moment you don't even realize, the person you're dating becomes your spouse, or it's the person who's going to become your spouse, the job you're in is gonna become your career, the neighborhood you're in is where you're gonna live for 20 years, but you don't see that, at the moment it's happening at that age. And so, as I say, I'm, I'm writing the thing about the, the game and all of a sudden I'm like, it kind of opens up before me. I'm like, okay, yeah, I get it. This is in a way at the heart of this whole story for these characters. And I make the notes and say, this is gonna be what she's gonna dwell on as the book comes to the end. You know? So that's the way that kind of, that works. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. Hi. Um, you've talked a lot of, oops, just broke the chair. Um, you, you've talked a lot about um, the, the history and the plot development, but what you haven't talked about is how you come up with your characters. Yep. And I'm interested specifically in um, Duchess, who is amoral, and Billy, who is a 50-year-old, 10-year-old. Yep. And um, I'm, I'm just curious how you thought these up and where they came from. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, uh, none of the characters in my books are based on anybody. All the characters in all of my work are inventions. And uh, it, it is a, I think it's, it's, it's probably the most, if for young writers, it's, it's one of the two, three most important aspects of craft that you really want to focus on mastering as a young writer, because at the heart of novels, what brings them to life, life are our sense that the individuals that we're following in the course of the story are real to us. And if a, if a writer can't in some way bring that, those characters to life in a way that is believable to us and electric to us, the, the book kind of falls apart, even if it's terrifically well written and you know, extremely interesting and, you know, in terms of its themes, et cetera, it just doesn't hold our attention. We need, you need those characters to come to life. And so it's a very important part of the craft. And so the, the way that uh, I developed it for about, you know, is, is really through, like of course, through practice, which is that as a young person writing many, many, many short stories from all different perspectives. You know, I'd write a story from the perspective of, uh, you know, a violin maker in Vienna in the 19th century. And then I'd write a story about a, you know, a young woman uh, on the, you know, at the early stages of the feminist movement at Berkeley in the 60s. And then I'd write about, you know, a, uh, a young black boy in Atlanta, you know, in the, in the 30s or what have you. I mean, I'd, I'd just keep writing <clears throat> from different perspectives. Whether it's third person, first person, doesn't really matter. What you're trying to do is to capture the internal life of an individual and have the reader understand that internal life through the word choice. You know, not through a description of, oh, this person was this way, and that's how they acted, and that's how they thought, and that's how they felt, which doesn't work. What it has to be is that as the character, is, say, is walking to a room and observing things, through the way in which they observe, what they see, how they, how, the language they use to sort of a, to uh, analyze what they see, what they attach to, what it makes them feel, through this, the reader hopefully gets an entry into the inner consciousness of that individual. So the the concept of character development is very closely tied to trying to capture a style of writing that is evocative of the inner life of a character. Now, and that's, so if you went back to rules of civility, it's a first person narrative from a 25 year old woman. It's very clear that it's her tone. In A Gentleman in Moscow, it's a third person narrative. But for anybody who's read it, I hope you, you know, all would agree that it, the narrative is an expression of his inner consciousness. 
It's the language that he would use. It's his sense of humor. It's, it's his foibles. It's his, you know, highfalutin style sometimes. And it's his, get, him getting, it's all, that's all the language of describing things in a third person is really an expression of what he sees, how he feels, what he thinks, and, and in a language that is consistent with his upbringing and personality. And so the Lincoln Highway creates a, a more, a, a bigger challenge for me, and hope, you know, maybe for you as a reader too, and that it is told from eight perspectives. And as you shift from one perspective to the next, the language has to shift with it. So that the Emmett chapter has to sound to you, even though it's third person, like Emmett's inner life, in the same way that the Wooly chapter, which is in third person, has to sound different. It has to sound like Wooly's inner life. His vocabulary, his semantics, his philosophical concerns, his sense of what is funny or poetic or what have you, you know. And uh, so, you know, this is in a way, it's sort of a weird answer to your question because this is the way the characters really get developed in, in my practice, you know, which is, is figuring out the, knowing a little bit of what they're like from a personality standpoint, but then really discovering them through the language that they're going to be using as they witness the world. You know, and that's how it happens. And Duchess is kind of an interesting case in that um, Duchess I had, was a very early uh, part of the, uh, the design of this book, the invention of this book, was Duchess's personality. I had this idea. I knew that he was going to be an inner city kid. I knew that he was from the New York. I knew he was going to be from sort of a tougher part of the, of the world. And I had this notion of wouldn't it be interesting if you were a young man who wasn't very well educated, you grew up in a tough part of the city, but where your father, a sort of a post-vaudevillian, was in the business of doing Shakespearean monologues. Like, what would that be like? Like, you imagine, like, you're that young guy, you're surrounded by, you know, you're living with your father, you're surrounded by vaudevillians in, a, in the dying ages of vaudeville. So it's magicians and, you know, and, and distortionists and storytellers and what have you, all kind of quasi-con men and alcoholics, you know, basically. That's who you're surrounded with, but sort of colorful people who are always, you know, performing at one stage or another. But your father is doing Shakespearean monologues, and you've heard them hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. So even though you're not very well educated, you've got access to the Shakespearean language. And, you know, particularly the monologues, and then an aspect of that that's interesting is if you only hear the monologues, then you get kind of... Shakespearean qualities of, of high thought and, and you know, uh, robust description and sort of poetic discourse and, and great sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know, speechifying, as it were. You're getting all that from the monologues, but if you don't see the plays, you don't really know the context, right? So if you do a Hamlet monologue and a Macbeth monologue, you don't know that Macbeth's a killer and a villain or that Hamlet's a hero, you know? You just know the speech. And it's like, well, I know that would be a really interesting sort of thing, like to be a young person. So it's sort of, Duchess got hatched out of this weird thought, you know? And so, so as I say, then you're like, okay, now I'm beginning to get a feel for him because he's going to be raised in this, you know, among, among all these vaudevillians and his father's going to be sort of a quasi-con man and a drinker and he's got this Shakespearean language and he's not going to be well, very well educated and that's where I start to discover how he thinks what he sounds like, how he navigates the world, it all kind of grows out of that, you know? But I don't really have a full command of him until, until I'm starting to write paragraphs, and then I can start to hear him. Wooly is a great case of this. Um, you know, it's this little thing. I love the character Wooly in the book, and, uh, and you're, you, I had all these ideas about him. He's sort of from an aristocratic background. He's sort of a lost soul. Uh, his family, he loved his family and sort of the heyday of, of their wealth, and, but everything is kind of beginning to dissipate. You know, his father died in the war, his mother's remarried and moved to Florida. He's been kicked out of three boarding schools, and he doesn't really quite feel like he can live up to the, who his grandfather was. You know, he's sort of a, a, a kid from a wealthy background who's lost and, and getting more lost by the minute. And, and I kind of know this, but my real sense of Willie comes when in the course of trying to write him, you start to land on little things about the way he talks or thinks, really thinks, because it's in, in third person. And the example is, is I sort of came on this little thing of that he repeats himself at the beginning of certain sentences. So he'll say, he'll say something like, um, say, oh, uh, you know, the thing about, the thing about spices, the, the thing about spices is that, and, and you know, he talks in the book about the fact that how many, you know, so many spices begin with the letter C. 
Like how interesting that is. How, why is that? Why do so many, you know, cloves and cinnamon and cardamom and cumin and, you know, there must have been something about the letter C that prompted people to, you know, that, that, to point, you know, to name flavors after them, right? But, but he starts with this sort of thing, about, you know, the thing about the letter C, the thing about the letter C, and I kind of could hear him repeating that opening phrase before getting into whatever he's going to say, and I'm like, yeah, that's the guy. You know, it's almost like he says it and he's getting excited by the notion. It's coming so fast, he's kind of repeating himself because the notion's coming right behind it, you know, as he sort of starts to try to imagine what this sort of observation is going to be like. So you sort of find a little thing like that, as I say, and then that becomes an aspect of the personality as well as a part of the narrative tone. Sorry, I don't know, it's maybe too abstract. <laughs> anyway, all right, sorry about it. <laughs> the weird one. Yes, please, right there. Do I lose? Do I lose myself yeah, when I'm writing the books? Because you're into all these. You, you sort of. It feels like you become all these people, or they become you, and then it gets all. What happens to Amor? Yeah. I mean, what? Right. No. Yeah. You. You would hope uh, that. The answer is yes, of course, that the, the artistic process in any field, I think, uh, is famously one that at its best is where the artist loses themselves into whatever the craft is, whether you're Jackson Pollock painting or you know, you're Nijinsky dancing, you know, Pollock disappears, Nijinsky disappears, and then it's just the, uh, the expression of the craft itself. In modern parlance, you know, flow is one of the ways that, that has been described. Something where you, you have such a command of the underlying uh, necessities of the craft that you no longer have to think about them, and you can then immerse yourself in them, and they can sort of happen without your managing them. You can sort of go along for the ride, and, and that absolutely happens in the writing process at its best. And actually, this is sort of interesting. I think is is. I, I go on and on about how I'm an outliner and a planner, and but most people. The, uh, the, the reason why I am is, is counterintuitive. And the reason is I outline is actually so that when I'm writing a chapter, this aspect can come, take over at the maximum level. Meaning that uh, if I know that in the chapter, this is what's going to happen, this is what the setting is, this is who enters the room, you know, in the middle of the chapter, this is what they say, I don't have to think about those things. And that means that I can instead allow my subconscious to take over the writing of the chapter. Because I know what's going to happen, so it really comes a question of how is it put? How is it expressed? What is the language that's used? What images? What illusions or allegories pop up? What's sort of the, 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 almost the poetic tone of the paragraphs? That's really what I'm interested in having take place while I'm writing the chapter. And the, by, the more I know about it, the more practice I've had in writing, the more likely it is that you can go into that process where you disappear and the thing sort of unfolds before you, and, the, and that's really ideal. Um, whereas the alternative is I don't know all that stuff. Then you go into the chapter and you're having to solve the problems. What's happening? What does the room look like? Wait, someone comes in the room, but who are they? And what's their background? And so that your, your, your attention's focused on all that stuff and no longer on this critical aspect of what does the language sound like? And how do you let the poetry of the event kind of surface and express itself in a way that you don't manage? You know? We're getting into some real abstract stuff here. I don't know. It's, me. it's my fault. Summer. I guess it's summer. This is not abstract at all. Okay. Um, so in thinking about uh, character and the last two pages of uh, The Lincoln Highway... Oh, but, but we're not going to ask say anything about what happens in the last two pages, though, right? Yeah. yeah. Because we're not, no spoilers. So, uh, yeah. so you're either going to have to phrase your question in a way which does not, you know, give away anything, or you have to find me afterwards. Now, <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll also say this: I mean, you know, there, there is the, the the final pages of the Lincoln Highway have a, a, create, pose a variety of questions, and uh, which a book should do, I think. But I got enough questions about a couple of things in particular about that that if you go to amortolls.com. For any of my books, there's a Q&A that I've written, which is sort of a whole series of answers to questions that I thought you would find interesting about the book as I was writing it or about the content of the book or et cetera. But at the bottom of that is answers to frequently asked questions. And the very last one in the Lincoln Highway list is, what's with the ending? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, you know, and, I, and I talk about it in some detail there. Um, but you can still go on with your question if you can do it in a way that doesn't spoil anything. I can't. Okay. 
Thank you for your frankness and your honesty. <laughs> Can I take a stab at it? Because like, I don't want to do any spoil alerts. Okay. So very consciously, I want to ask you, without giving anything away, and I don't know how you can answer it. I didn't know about checking out the website, which I will do. Yeah. Do you want us to make a moral judgment? Or do you have a moral judgment? Um, you know, I, I think, um, do I have a moral judgment? The, the rough answer is, is no. I mean, I, I, I think that, well, the way I think of it is that if I think about my experience in reading the best of literature, Shakespeare, Tolstoy, Conrad, Faulkner, Toni Morrison, Edith Wharton, you know, whatever. When you close the book, ideally you should be filled with all kinds of ideas and sentiments and around the characters, about the characters, but certainty should not be the prevailing feeling. You know, because usually if certainty is, is uh, certainty that the book is about this, or this is good and that is bad. You know, if that's the feeling, then you probably, it's a bad sign for the book. You know, and it would probably feel a little bit like a thump to us as we finish it, you know. Because life isn't like that, right? It's much more, whether or not, you know, Anna Karenina does what she should do, you know, in the course of her life is a complicated question. You know, should she cheat on her husband or not and why? And, you know, and where does love come from? And can you, can you fend it off for, you know, how long can you fend it off without, you know, destroying yourself? And, you know, and then ultimately, what should you do when things go awry in your life or you give up your child and all this, all these all these emotional things? There's no simple answers to any of it, right? And that's what makes reading Tolstoy so rich to us. And so I, I in that tradition, I, I do try to write in a way that the, all the nuances are there available to you. You know, and so the, the, the complexities of human life are there so that you may say, you know, you may struggle with, and I hope you do struggle with, what, did he do the right thing or not? Or did she do the right thing or not? And because and, in you were in that situation, would it be obvious to you? You know, no. But eventually you do something and you have to live with the consequences. And, uh, and, and maybe that's okay. You know, so, so I am kind of more interested in something that feels that way at the end. Yes, in the middle here. Yeah, sorry. Uh, how you developed uh, Billy, who, I don't know, has a, a magical quality or, uh, uh, this, don't take offense, please, but Baby Yoda comes to mind oh. where <laughs> he makes everyone around him so much better and has a sort of superpower, but also this incredible innocence and vulnerability. And I was wondering, you know, how you built that up and if there were predecessors in literature that you were thinking about as you did that? Um, you know, uh, there's no predecessor in literature, that's for sure. I mean, I wasn't basing him on, on a different uh, character from a different work. Um, but I must say that I do feel that uh, the invention of Billy is partly, a, it grows out of uh, my constant amazement in dealing with young people eight-year-olds of how wise they are, you know, and, and maybe, and Billy is an exaggerated version of that for sure, but I don't think that anything that Billy observes or does is out of the scope of what an eight-year-old can do, you know, and, and if anything, like, and I think one of the interesting things, and, and I was very conscious of this aspect of Billy, let's say, I don't know, you're on a riving, river rafting trip with your, you know, college friends or whatever, there's 10 of you and there's five couples or whatever it is and you're all 45 or 50 or whatever and you bring an eight-year-old. Like, you know, what, 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 what does the intrusion of that eight-year-old do to the people? You know, it changes everybody and probably for the better. You know, as you, the kid is like, oh, did you see what happened? You know, did you see that bird over there? You know, or, or why is the water this way and not that way? And, you know, and, and all the grown-ups are ready to have a beer. Are like, oh, yeah, that's a good question, you know? So, so, so there's sort of this thing of like, it, you know, because we normally live our lives where you have all the eight-year-olds are over there, and we're over here having the beer, you know? But so, so I was very conscious of the fact that here was this group of three 18-year-old boys, and you put an eight-year-old in the middle, and it changes the dynamic. And, uh, and that, that, you know, we can... See the, we, we're gonna see the world differently when you bring, the, and now Billy's gonna see the world differently by virtue of being around the 18 year olds too, right? It goes both ways. Um, but uh, so, so it was kind of in that, in that sort of spirit. Now I'd say, I, I would go an added step that um, 
uh, I suppose, uh, some people ask me about this. In modern parlance, I think you, could, you would probably say maybe Billy is on the spectrum, you know, in the modern language. Now, I don't really think about that or care about it in the context of the book because it's not relevant in a book about 1954, nor is it relevant to the story. But I'm just talking about in terms of a combination of characteristics. And you can find, uh, you know, certain young people who have, are, are, for instance, read the same book over and over and over and therefore have very intense knowledge about it. And you meet young people, let's say, who are, they're obsessed with dinosaurs. You know, you don't have to be uh, on the spectrum to be obsessed with dinosaurs. But if you are, but you know, those young people are, they can have a very high level knowledge and insight about an par arcane part of the world. Like it's amazing in a way. And that might be matched with uh, a sense of awkwardness around another aspect of the world. And you see that in Billy to some degree. When Billy is threatened, he retreats. He doesn't really know what to do. He kind of shuts down. Uh, he also uses repetitive language in a very specific way. He's very literal. When someone asks him a question, he answers it very literally. You know, he likes to, he's read the same book, you know, 26 times. He'll tell you exactly how many times he's read it. So there's these sort of specific characteristics, I think, of, that you can find in a young person where they do have sort of, uh, it, there's certain things that they're doing extremely well and there's other things that they're having which are, are, are not as natural to them. And, and that's a beautiful thing when it happens. And then you sort of put that among the 18-year-olds and it becomes you know, another step of interesting, in my opinion. Yes, um, I had a, a question about, uh, obviously, you've talked about plotting out the novel uh, very specifically, but I was wondering if you've ever had characters that took you in a direction that you weren't planning on going in, and whether you accept that or fight that, or, or how do you deal with that? Uh, it happens all the time, for sure, because even though you're an outliner, you're constantly, uh, when things are going well, you're discovering where things should actually be going instead of where you had planned. And that often is character driven. Um, and uh, in all of my books, that's true. Uh, you know, a very big example of this in Rules of Civility was that uh, Katie's best friend is this uh, character named Eve, who uh, was a real tough, uh, tr she's a terrific sort of spunky character from the Midwest and a little bit of a hard edge to her, very uh, independent minded. And um, she, in the original design of Rules of Civility in the outline, it said, you know, she was gonna leave midway because a relationship breaks up and so sort of she was gonna go home to, you know, Katie, Katie was gonna run into her and she's like, yeah, the relationship's over. She can say, what are you gonna do? And she say, yeah, I'm gonna go back and see, you know, pay my folks a visit. I haven't seen him in a while. Go back to Indiana, see my folks. And I was writing the chapter and literally writing the sequence where uh, I was doing to describe Eve getting off the train in Chicago. Her fam parents had come from Indiana to pick her up. And as I'm writing it, I was like, Eve would never do this, like, you know? She would never, you know? It's one thing to say, I'm gonna go back and see my folks. It's another thing to go back to Indiana, you know? And, and, and I got nothing against Indiana. I'm just saying, you know, for Eve. <laughs> and so like literally as I'm writing the paragraph, I, I, I suddenly it's, it's the parents are there in the train station and Eve doesn't get off. And it takes them, they, they, you know, they try to track down the conductors of the train over a period of days and they discover that Eve, as coming into Chicago, bought a ticket, extended her train ride to LA. And she's disappeared in Hollywood, you know? And, uh, and, and that felt like that's, that's just right. And you know, I ended up writing six short stories which are called Eve in Hollywood, which follow her to Hollywood, in which you can get uh, Shakespeare and Company in New York. It's sort of a small run print that I just did for the fun of it. But that's how much like, her motion to Hollywood captured me, you know, because I was, because then I was like, oh my God, what happened to her? You know, and, and, and I followed her there and, you know, <laughs> imagine the whole thing. So yes, it is absolutely true that the characters can take control, you know, in, in, in key ways. And that's great when it happens. Yes, sorry. I'll keep it simple. Yeah. Um, I, I was left at the end of uh, Lincoln Highway wondering what will happen in San Francisco yeah. to Emmett and Billy and Sally. Will there be a sequel? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, that's, yeah I appreciate it. I'm, you know, I'm glad that you, that you wondered what happens to them next. My general feeling is I usually like to leave the futures of my characters in the capable hands of my readers. 
That is my general feeling. Now, you know, that said, I, I think of everything I've written, I would not do a sequel to A Gentleman in Moscow, that's for sure. You know, I did follow Eve to Hollywood, but I would never write about Katie or Tinker, you know, in the case of Rules of Civility. In the case of the Lincoln Highway, I could imagine doing something down the road, but it'd be probably 10 years from now. It wouldn't be the kind of thing that I'd want to pick it up immediately. I'd want to go do different things for a while and then maybe circle back to, to them, because I'm, I'm intrigued by what happens to them too. <laughs> right? um, I know we're running out of time, so I wanted, I wanted, to, I wanted to touch on, on two quick things, uh, uh, if that's all right, uh, or two things. The first was, because you know, and, and some of you may know this story, but I can't, I can't resist telling it because uh, is, is I, you know, my, my, I don't really involve my own personal life very much in my work. Um, I, I'm a fabulist more than I am a, you know, memoirist. And uh, but occasionally things pop up and they kind of get find their way into my narratives. And uh, and you know, a big one was in a, in a gentleman in Moscow is ba is tied to Martha's Vineyard because when I was eight years old. And this was written about in the Gazette once, so I apologize if you know this story. But when I was eight years old, I put a note in a bottle and uh, threw it out into the ocean off West Chop. And when I got home at the end of summer, uh, there was a letter for me, uh, and, you know, this big, typewritten into Master Amor Tolls from uh, Harrison Salisbury, who was one of the uh, managing editors of the New York Times. And he had found the, uh, the bottle. And so we corresponded from the age of eight to 18, um, and, and eventually I met him at the age of 18. And when I moved to, I went to New York, sorry, moved. I went to New York for the first time in my life and, and, and we had tea together and he was an amazing person. Now, when, when I wrote A Gentleman in Moscow, I don't like to do research, but I might, I tend to like do a little research when I'm done writing a first draft. And so I, I, when I wrote A Gentleman in Moscow, I'd never been to the Metropole Hotel, never spent a night there. So I thought, okay, I'll write the first draft and then I'll fly to Moscow, I'll move into the hotel and I'll start to revise the book while I'm there. And while I'm there, I'll bring first-hand accounts by famous people of, of things that happened in the Metropole Hotel. And there's a lot of that available because there were only a couple of fine hotels in Russia between the Revolution and the Cold War. So John Steinbeck wrote about events in the Metropole Hotel when he went to Russia. Lillian Hellman, the Martha's Vineyard, famous Martha, uh, Martha's Vineyard playwright, uh, wrote about her experiences at the Metropole Hotel. Uh, e. e. Cummings did. Uh, a whole slew of journalists did because all the journalists drank at the Metropole Hotel. So, so I was kind of gathering all of these sort of memoirs of journalists who had done time in Russia, or you know, uh, sort of, sort of were reported in Russia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was bringing them as I was getting ready to go to Russia to, you know, with the first draft finished and to go move into the Metropole, uh, I was sort of glancing at some of these memoirs that I was gonna carry with me to read through as I began the revision process. And one of the first ones I look at, the guy says, oh, you know, uh, and then I went down to the Red, Red Square, it was, you know, a guy from AP or something. And he said, I went to Red Square and I ran into Salisbury. And, and I was like, oh my God, Salisbury, of course. I'd completely forgotten that Harrison Salisbury was the Moscow bureau chief at the end of the Second World War into the early eight stages of the Cold War. So I immediately Googled and sure enough, he wrote a memoir about his time in Moscow. So, you know, I, I buy it through the secondary market and I put it in my bag and I carry it with me to Moscow. And I, I get in the Metropole Hotel and I open it and on the first page it says, you know, I landed in the, the you know, Harrison's talking, you know, I landed in the airport, I climbed in the taxi and I said, take me to the Metropole Hotel. And sure enough, that's where he lived when he was the Moscow bureau chief for the New York Times. And so I, you know, I was reading through it and I ended up weaving a couple of his memories from Moscow into the novel. And then I was like, wait, if I'm gonna do that, then Salisbury should be in the novel too. So he actually appears in the novel in the late, in the 1950s by name. And I knew that the Count at one point would need a trench coat and fedora to sort of be in a disguise. And so he steals them from Salisbury. That's what he does. Which was my way of sort of repaying this very kind man who showed me interest in me, you know, as a, as a, as a boy and uh, as a young adult. Um, okay, so the, the last thing I wanted, to that's a little Martha's Vineyard story there for you. Uh, but uh, is, is, uh, the last thing I want to share with you is, is about how I think about history in my work. Uh, sometimes people refer to my work as historical fiction. I don't really think of that way. Or they'll say he's an historical novelist. I don't think of myself as that. I just think of myself as a novelist. Now, I don't mind if you use that terminology. That's fine. But, but I, I wanted to talk to you about how I think of history in the course of my work. And the best way that I can do this is by a parallel. And, and the parallel is uh, the set 
of a play. So imagine that you're, go, you're here in a theater to see a play. You know, not to see me. And it, let's say it's a Chekhovian play. Let's say it's, you know, the, the Cherry Orchard. Now, from where you're sitting, you're looking across the stage, and it's the living room of the country estate of the family, uh, the fine living room. At the back of the living room is our French doors, and through the French doors, you can see in the distance the cherry orchard itself, and it's in, let's say it's in bloom, it's in blossom. So you can see the white and pink petals in the distance because it's spring, it's in the afternoon, so the evening light is you know, sort of dappling on the, on the, the leaves, and you can see that in the distance, in the petals. Um, now, of course, when you're sitting in a theater looking across the stage through the French doors at the cherry orchard, what you are actually looking at is a painted canvas because that's what you do on a stage. The back set tends to be a painting of some kind done, uh, completed with using the Renaissance tools of perspective to give you the illusion of distance. Now, when the team paints that canvas, they are not going to render the trees in a realist style because that would look very weird to the naked eye. Instead, what they're going to do is they're going to use an impressionist style. They'll paint it in the manner of uh, Monet or Renoir, where it's a little fuzzy, and it kind of gives us that sense of we can almost see the petals moving in the breeze. We can see the light changing and sort of capturing different aspects of the color. And also, at that distance, it makes sense. It's a little blurry, because it should be at that distance, right? Because that's the way our eyes work. Um, so this is the way you would set that up. Now in front of the canvas, on either side of the French door, are uh, bookcases. Now they are built out of plywood and painted to look like mahogany in this fine living room. And over here is a, a mahogany, a plywood door that's painted to look like mahogany that goes nowhere. Here's you know, a staircase that goes up to nothing, right? That's a part of the set. And, and the, they built, the crew has built this to give us the sense of the room. Now in front of that, however, is an actual table surrounded by actual chairs on which there is an actual China tea service. And this is very important because that they be actual. Because when uh, the characters come out, let's say it's a brother and sister, the sister is sitting at the table, she's serving herself tea, and the brother enters. You can see he's in a state of agitation. Something is on his mind. And when he pulls back the chair abruptly, at the table, we want to hear the wood of the legs scrape against the wooden surface of the stage. And when he sits down and pulls up and begins to share his concerns with his sister uh, and express his opinions, you know, and he slaps the surface of the table for emphasis, we want to hear the physicality of that, of the hand hitting that hard wood surface of the table. And when she patiently, having listened to him, sets down <coughs> her coffee cup, you know, we want teacup. We want to hear the clink of the cup on the saucer in this patient gesture. You know, and so this is this dynamic uh, is really the way that I build my work. And so, if you think of history, for me, it is the painted backdrop. And I not only is it not designed to be perfectly, you know, like real life. In fact, I am specifically intending to do it in an impressionist style. Because what I wanted to do is to give you that sense of a moment in time, a little sense of space, a sense of mood. That's what history is there for in my work. Now in front of that, there's a lot of plywood painted to look like mahogany in my work. <laughs> you know. And what I mean by that is the stuff that when you read it, I want you to be like, wait, did that really happen? You know, was there a body circus in Brooklyn called the circus in the 50s? Did the hobos actually sleep on the High Line? You know, is that true? And, uh, and that's great. And sometimes they are true and sometimes they're not true and I don't want you to be able to tell the difference. <laughs> but in front of the plywood, you know, stuff, the fake stairs, the fake door, is the table, the chairs in which the characters are sitting and that's really my focus in the work. Is, and that's the stuff that I want to feel very real to you. And in fact, so when a character in my book does pull up a chair at a table to talk to another character in a heated fashion, I want that to feel so real to you that you feel like you are sitting at that table. You are listening to the conversation. You can see their faces and read the nuances of, their, in, in, of what they mean uh, through the expressions that they're making. And you can hear in their tone what they're driving at or what they're hiding.
But as they're exchanging sentiments and ideas, I want that to be the thing that feels most real to you. Because ultimately, in a novel, that's where the action is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.